We're reading through the book of Daniel as a church. It's an Old Testament book, and we are enjoying its message. I think we, we need its message in every era, but this seems to be a particularly poignant book in this era of the church. And we're in chapter 3 now, so we're moving somewhat swiftly uh, through this book. We're not going to take a, a real long time in it. We try as a church to do different uh, paces of series so that we get through uh, large sections of the Bible somewhat swiftly, get a feel for different books in the Bible, and certainly there's other moments where we go very slowly. This, this book, we're going to move a little more swiftly. We're looking again at a whole chapter this morning. I remember a particular moment when I was a teenager that stands out to me as humbling, as still convicting to this day, motivating. I was at the gym where my basketball team would practice. I, I think it must have been after practice some point because the guys were just kind of hanging around different teammates, some of which I knew better than others. And at one point, there was this abrupt decision made by the group to respond to an invitation from a parent that I didn't know very well and their son to go get some kind of snack or treat or something. Candy was referenced, and for teenage boys, that's, a, that's an almost irresistible temptation. And my understanding was that they were going to drive somewhere, that this, the parents were going to drive somewhere to a store and pick some stuff up for us. And I knew immediately in that moment this was not something that I would be allowed to do. This was not a family that I knew. This was not a teammate that I would have respected, that my parents would have trusted at all. And so I knew as the group is agreeing, yeah, let's, let's go. And I'm envisioning we're going to drive somewhere. This is wrong. This is not what I should do clear sense in my conscience of this would be disobedience. This would not be following the Lord's calling on my life, what I'm supposed to do. But I began to reason with myself because it seemed like the whole crowd was going. I began to talk to myself and, and come up with ways that I could, I could compromise reasonably. Maybe, maybe I can just, I'll really pay attention where we drive. I'll, I'll, I'll really watch where we're going so that I, I know exactly where we are all the time. I just began to reason in my head, well, how, can I, how can I make this work so I, I don't have to be the only one that isn't doing what everyone else... I know it's wrong, but gosh, I'm just going to stand out so clearly if I say I, I can't go right now. It's, it's going to seem foolish. It's going to seem snobbish, maybe even arrogant, I, I, weird. I don't want to seem weird. So I just began to reason with myself, and I resolved I, I was going to go. Now, it turned out they weren't going anywhere. <laughs> they were just going out to the parking lot. So this whole trial apparently was just of the Lord to reveal something in my heart, to reveal a willingness to say no to God and yes to everyone else. It's convicting. Because ultimately, that same choice is faced every day by every Christian. Sometimes we're aware of what we're doing and sometimes we're not. But the choice is the same. I'm going to ask you two questions and see if you could diagnose what was going on in my heart. What did I want most in that moment? What did I want most, more than anything else? What was I giving myself to most? And the second question, which is just a reflection of it, what did I fear most in that moment? What did I want most and what did I fear most? That's a question you can ask about any moment. Any moment you're making a decision, what do I want most and what do I fear most? Any moment you can ask that question. And Daniel chapter 3 was written to God's people to help us answer that question correctly, 
to help us deal with those kinds of moments correctly. It paints an extreme but similar scenario that's been repeated throughout history in just that extremity and in a thousand little moments that reflect it. Daniel 3 was written, ultimately inspired by God, written so that God's people in facing those kinds of moments could have something in their hearts and on their minds that would help them to answer correctly. What do I want most? And what do I fear most? This is a lengthy chapter. I'm going to basically walk through the story in six different brief sections, just so we kind of feel the, the progressing drama of it. And I'll summarize the sections with a single word. The first section I'm going to summarize by calling it the call. The call, the accusation, the threat, the response, the surprise, and the results. Let's just walk through one section at a time. First of the call, chapter 3, verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Remember that Nebuchadnezzar is the emperor of Babylon, the mighty Babylon who had conquered the known world, as it were, were around the Mediterranean. He was irresistible in his authority in those days, and he seeks to represent that authority with a golden image. Now, this image would have been grotesquely, overwhelmingly, absurdly huge in that culture. 90 feet by 9 feet is the size of this obelisk. It is overwhelmingly large. This isn't a, a land of skyscrapers and so forth. This is an overwhelming, extravagant image. And it's apparently covered in gold. And if we want a little bit of background here with what's going on with this call to worship the image, we can remember two things. First of all, you remember in chapter 2, God told Nebuchadnezzar by a dream that he was only the first in a succession of kingdoms, that he was like a head of gold that would be replaced by a body of silver and then thighs of bronze, legs of iron and clay, and that there was going to be a series of kingdoms. Well, it's not difficult to imagine that this image in some ways is a reaction or a response to God's declaration that his kingdom would eventually come to an end. Because you notice the whole statue from the top to the bottom is gold. It's perhaps a little bit like Nebuchadnezzar saying, the gold part will last forever. Important piece of background. Another important piece of background. The location of this statue is basically in the same location, in the land of Shinar, where the Tower of Babel was erected. If you remember the Tower of Babel in Genesis, when all the people gathered together and said, let us build a tower that reaches to the heavens, and we will make a name for ourselves. Tower of Babel sort of epitomizes, it symbolizes mankind's attempt to dethrone or replace God, to defy God. And this towering gold pillar is essentially in exactly the same location. And you notice in the passage that Nebuchadnezzar wants representations from 
all nations and languages to come and worship and bow before this image. It's essentially an attempt, biblically speaking, to recreate Babel and to, in his own authority, command the nations that were scattered by God who in Genesis it says he came down to see the image, a tower that they had created. It's, it's a reversal of that. It's essentially saying, Nebuchadnezzar, I'm going to gather the representatives of the world. As it were, the world will come at my command. They will bow at the symphony that I have constructed, and they will worship the image that I command them to worship. It's a call. It's a call to false worship. All must obey. The consequences for disobedience are that they will be tossed, it says, into a fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar seems to claim, I have the power to command worship and over life and death. Your life is in my hands, he says, and all the nations will be represented here. The repetition in this passage uh, is just stark. You notice it repeats again and again, the prefects and the governors, almost this silly, unnecessary repetition. I mean, you could get the senses, we get it. We, we, everybody, everybody that's anybody is there. And then it repeats the, the, the type of instruments there later in the passage. The, the point is, through the repetition, is to emphasize, look, th- this was universal, Nobody's excluded. <laughs> there is nobody that is anybody that is standing out. Every single person is going to be included in this call to false worship. Nebuchadnezzar's power will be seen as absolute. His image will be seen as absolutely revered. There will be no exceptions. You must include yourself in this call to worship. And in some ways, it would not have been difficult for the people of the day to comply. One commentator on the passage, Tremper Longman, explains. He says, people of the time would by and large have had little difficulty with this request. After all, most people in the ancient Near East were polytheists, used to acknowledging many deities. They could easily assimilate this statue into their religious scheme especially under the duress of capital punishment. But this was not true of the Judeans in the exile. Their belief in one God prohibited participation in this ritual, and the adversaries knew it. It strikes me how similar this scene is to our day and age. We don't have obelisks of gold that are set up, but then again, maybe we do. We have a culture that is not any different from the culture of the Tower of Babel or the obelisk of Nebuchadnezzar. It's not very different. The call is pervasive. You must fall in line with the worship of this world, whatever the current culture proclaims it to be, if it's sensual pleasure, if it's materialism, if it's a diverse view of sexuality, if it's any number of self-promotion or pride or some worship of animal spirits in this earth, whatever it is, you must participate in some way. You must include yourself. It doesn't have to be the only thing you worship, but you have to worship this. You can worship other things too. That's fine, but you have to include yourself. The main thing you can't do is fail to worship the call to worship that the world utters. It's not that different from today, really. It feels the same. It feels as though Everyone is including themselves. This is a pervasive, overwhelming choice. It's actually a public duty. It's just a part of living life in the culture. The same call to worship comes to every Christian, not in heaven yet. One warning I I think this passage speaks to us, it would have spoken to the exiles as well, is be prepared for the call to false worship. Do you hear that symphony? Because it's still playing today. If you don't hear it 
anymore. It may be that you're so accustomed to responding to it, it's become second nature. Do you hear the symphony calling for devotion and time and energy and choice given to anything other than the one true God? Do you hear that symphony still playing? It's still playing. The call. Second section, the accusation. The accusation, verse 8. Let's keep reading the story. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. The accusation. It's interesting to me that these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these three companions of Daniel, uh, apparently were not protesting the event uh, it's not as though they were out on the side of the obelisk courtyard with signs, doom to all who worship the image of Nebuchadnezzar. We don't get any sense of that. They're not shouting, you will all be in ruin. We don't, we don't get any sense. They, they apparently just chose not to respond. They, they chose not to do what Nebuchadnezzar commanded everyone to do. We don't have any sense of, of protest here or revolution. Just the quiet unwillingness to abandon their worship of the one true and only God. But the unwillingness to be involved in that false worship was sufficient for them to be accused. This is an important point, and you can imagine for the Jews who are hearing this, this message, really, from the book of Daniel, Daniel's making a point. Look, it, it, it's not ultimately your security to finally just be in silence, to be in hiding. At the end of the day, the false worship symphony will find you out and will demand that you participate. It's not enough to only be in silence because in the end, you will be accused of not participating. You can't just not uh, worship in silence. You have to positively affirm and worship. That's, that's the, the accusation that's brought. You notice this accusation comes and says, you, Nebuchadnezzar, you, you are an, on, the, on the balance sheet here. How will they respond to you? They are not paying attention to you. They are not worshiping the image you have set up. There's an accusation. And accusations will always come. When God's people do not worship the images of this world. Jesus himself promised that this would take place. In Matthew 10, it says this, Brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father, his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. What's Daniel doing in, in writing down this story to hand it down to posterity? He's preparing them. He's reminding them, look, you might feel safe as long as you don't make too much noise. Ultimately, even those who don't make too much noise can be accused. Evil wants false worship to take place. It, it, it's not enough not to denounce the evil. You have to positively affirm the evil, finally, in moments like this. Imagine the, the experience for these young men. 
not planning to overthrow Nebuchadnezzar, the evil king, but then their enemies in the court, probably jealous because they've been raised up with Daniel, find them out and point out, you know, there's a secret that these guys need to be uh, revealed. They, they, They worship only one God. They won't include the cultural adoration in their religion. They, they, they think that they can worship only one God. Nebuchadnezzar, you need to make an example of them. To this culture, their stance would have seemed arrogant and unnecessary. Think, think about it. To a polytheistic culture, someone who won't worship A God in that polytheistic culture seems arrogant and unnecessary. It's not as though they understand where they're coming from. In their mind, what's the big deal? It seems like just arrogant. Like you just, you won't participate with everyone. You think you're better than everybody else? What's the big deal? Just add it to your gods. You don't have to stop worshiping your God. Just worship this too. It would have seemed annoyingly irreverent. That happens today. Happens today all the time. There's a particular example that came to my mind, and that that is just the the sexual definition of this culture. And it struck me how it's tempting to think, well, as as long as we are kind and loving and not um, arrogant and rude, well, then we'll, we'll sort of hold on to our vision and beliefs, and we're not going to be judgmental and, and, and kind of angry all the time. We'll just be kind, and that will create kind of a happy coexistence. I think it's wrong. I think it's evil and sinful, but, but we, we don't have to bump in. We, we won't bump into anybody else. In this passage and countless others in the Bible says, you won't be able to get away with that. I'm not saying you should be rude, but it won't be enough to simply not denounce rudely. You're going to be asked to affirm positively. It won't be enough to just not say anything. You're going to be asked to say something. I've seen this happen personally with friends. It's, it's not enough just to be kind. The, the, the person in a, in a different worldview, different mindset will say, I want to know that you affirm what I'm doing. You must applaud, not just not denounce. It's exactly what happened here. Not enough that you're quiet. You have to be loud in the worship of this image. Let's be warned. Daniel's writing this so that they would be warned. You will not get away only with being silent. Now, I'm not saying it was wrong for them to be silent. I don't think they probably should have been out there protesting. I mean, this is a sinful world. Sinful things are going to happen. But they might have assumed they're safe only by doing that. Daniel removes that expectation from every Jewish exile. No, no, no. No, sooner or later, there's going to come a moment where you're asked to affirm evil, and if you won't, the result will be rage. We have to be prepared for that. Worshiping God alone means we have to say we will not worship anything else. Third section, the threat the threat. Verse 13, it says, Then Nebuchadnezzar in furious rage commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, If you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who, who is the God that will deliver you out of my hand? This brings it to a head. These three poor young men from Jerusalem that have been taken out of their homeland, they've already been set up in danger previous times, have now come to the point of the test. There's the fiery furnace and the image, and there is no other option. That's the threat. That's your choice. You will be killed or you will bow. 
choose. There are two roads, life and death. Which do you want? He is furious, it says. Furious rage. Furious at these young men who dare to stand when he says bow. Dare to claim that their God reserves the right of exclusive worship. Dare to stand against the call of the evil symphony on the plain of Babylon. Choose, he says. Bow or die. The same choice is presented in a thousand little ways and often in the same ways in church history. Will you give up your life in order to serve only God? The threat. They must join or die. Fourth, the response. The response, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Extraordinary response. Imagine the scene. Probably thousands, certainly hundreds of the most powerful officials in the empire gathered a symphony, a furnace, a burning furnace, and this golden image towering over the landscape, and these three young men standing before the greatest human power they could imagine and saying, we have no need to answer you, O king. If this be so, our God is able to rescue us and he will deliver us out of your hand. But if not, we will not worship your gods or bow to the image you have set up. Imagine the ripple of terror that works through the crowd. Imagine random prince from this land and the random governor from this land watching dumbfounded. They just said they wouldn't worship even if their God lets them die. They think he can save them. They even have some suspicion that he will save them. But they said even if he doesn't save them, they will not worship this image. Worshiping their God is more important even than dying and death by burning, no less. We worship God and God alone. No one else, no matter what happens. We don't know, ultimately, if he wills to save us from the fire or if he wills to use our death somehow in his grand design, but we trust him so much that even our lives we place in his hands to do with what he will. We will not know this. We will not. No compromise. No willingness to bend. 
No differentiation between public service and private religion. This is in public, a declaration. We will not worship your gods. Now, don't don't be confused. These men were not uh, revolutionaries. They were very willing to serve Nebuchadnezzar in a number of other kinds of ways. They do good to the kingdom. Daniel does good to the kingdom. He serves the country that he's in, his current country. He serves. He, He does good for them. He serves in political positions. He's a blessing to this nation. But when it comes down to this moment, he says, no, no, but there is a line. I will serve you, but I will not worship your gods, no matter what happens to me. The response. Number five, the surprise. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury. And the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. There's a couple of ironic hints in this passage to what the true king is seeing. You notice it at the very beginning of the passage when it says over and over and over again that Nebuchadnezzar set up the image. If you notice that, it repeats it repeatedly. He set up an image and then said, worship it. He set up the image and said, when you hear the sound, worship it. He set up an image. It says it over and over again. The writer is inviting us to see something. You have to set up the thing that you want everybody to worship. And then it happens again here. Who is the one that dies before they go into the furnace? What's the mighty men who are obeying Nebuchadnezzar? He can't keep them alive. They die, these mighty men. They toss them in, and the furnace is so hot just to get close enough to toss them in that they die from the flames. Imagine the scene. All of the people gathered, governors. Here comes the mighty champion. Who knows where he's, you know, Goliath of Macedonia. Here he comes, and he's got Abednego, and he, he, he gets closer, and he tosses them in, and the heat is so, I mean, he catches on fire. Who knows? He just he drops dead right then. It's a hint to prepare you. Who can save whose followers from the fire? Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the fire. They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. (laughs) Imagine the audience. They're all there, they t- the mighty man dies. They toss these guys in. He's sitting there. I don't even know how you could see what's happening to them with that kind of a furnace. But somehow he notices something he's never seen before, something that's impossible, something that can't happen. 
Fire consumes. Fire devours. He tossed them into the fire. He has the power of life and death. This is death. He tosses them into death. They will be consumed, eradicated. There'll be nothing left but bits. He's going to enjoy the roaring flames that devour them. He's going to sit back and watch while the power of their God is proven to be useless against the power of Nebuchadnezzar. And then, as you would imagine, he is surprised. He's astonished. He stands up. He begins to ask ridiculous questions to his counselors. Perhaps I've gone insane, he says. Guys, didn't, didn't we just... <laughs> th there was three of them, right? And we threw them into the fire. Yes. I'm always struck by the counselor's fear at this point. They don't answer anything else. Presumably, they can see the same thing. But they, all they say is, true. I'm not, I'm not going further than that. I'm not even going to tell you what you're seeing. I'm just going to say, true. True. I think that's safe. Yes, there were three of them. And yes, they were tied up. And I, that's all I'm saying right now. Three, and they're in the fire. Three of them, bound. Yes, True. So he has to keep talking. Okay, three, but now there's four, and they're untied, and they're walking around in the fire. They're walking, and they're not burning, and they don't even seem to be hurt, and there's more of them. Psalm 2 says, the nations rage against the Lord and against his anointed. And it says, the king in heaven looks at them and laughs. He laughs. It's okay to laugh when God laughs. And God's laughing. And it's a dangerous laughter. But it's laughter. It's supposed to be humorous. It's supposed to be humorous. God laughs. God says... Because do you know who makes fire and combustion? Who causes molecules, physical reactions to function the way they do? Do you know that every fire that ever took place was because I caused it to do that? It has no independent ability. Combustion doesn't happen on its own. It happens because God causes it to happen. This isn't a, a clock that God created and sits back and watches. No, every, every interaction, every physical interaction that ever happened, he caused it at that moment to happen. So we're sitting in these chairs right now, not because God created gravity and just watched it work, because God continues to cause gravity to work. We light a match. It, it lights not because God caused oxygen and flammable materials to work. Through. No, because God right then causes it to happen. And right here, he causes it to not happen. He says, no. They will not die today. You do not have the power of life and death. I do. Nebuchadnezzar is shocked. No kidding. He's surprised. He doesn't know what to do with this. This reveals a type of power he hasn't encountered before. Power over death itself. Power over the physical realities of the universe. Power to protect even the most vulnerable, even the most unprotected, even in the most vulnerable moment. And somehow power to be with their people, his people, even in the midst of their apparent doom. He's surprised. I can only imagine in that final moment, right before the three men were thrown into the furnace, they were assuming God apparently needs us in his perfect wisdom to die. Because I don't see any armies. There's no angels. I don't, nobody's coming to rescue. Right at the final moment before they were chucked in, they must have thought, well, I, uh, this is it, I guess. This is how we honor our God, by dying. Sinclair Ferguson says, the three friends were already committed to the flames before they knew precisely what form that grace would take. Would it be the grace of deliverance or the grace to die well for God's glory? Only in the moment of trial did it become clear exactly how God would show his faithfulness. So it is with us. Amen. I can only imagine that as they are there in the flames, perhaps... 
Isaiah 43, written years before, came to their mind. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. And when you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Now certainly this wasn't a permission for every Israelite boy to walk over a fire pit at home. That's not the intention. There's a metaphorical sense in Isaiah. But they must have been thinking, yeah, but God can make the metaphor real also. He, he can literally make it the case that we'll walk through fire and not be burned. The surprise. Finally, the result. Verse 26 says, Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace, and he declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, the, there is the list again, the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. And Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their house is laid in ruin for there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Daniel does this over and over and over again. The very thing that the, the evil ones attempt to do to destroy and remove and harm God's people ultimately produces the opposite result. Their God is magnified and they are promoted. Now again, like I said last week, we don't read this as a promise and that every time you stand for God, you're going to become the CEO, okay? That's not the point of the passage. The point is this. God is able to turn evil into good for his purposes and his people. The very things the enemy tries to do to hurt and destroy God's people will ultimately prove for the exaltation of God's people and his own glory and his own wisdom and his own ways from one person to the next and one generation to the next. That's the way it always is going to be. That's what happens happens in the book of Acts, which we're going to study next year. You notice in that book, again and again and again, evil and harm and difficulty comes to the church, and people try to destroy the church, but the very things they try to do, not only are they not fruitful, they ac accomplish the opposite result, and the word multiplies, and God is more glorified, and God's people are more useful. And suffering, which happens and takes place, results in the, the, even greater than the person who suffered could have done if they hadn't suffered. Like Stephen in the beginning of Acts accomplishes more through his death than he ever could have accomplished in his life. Remember, when we read these stories, we want to read them like a story. And we, we get to the end, and there should be this clear, central point. What's the clear, central point that strikes your heart at the end of this story? What do you think this, this story written to a Jewish person in the exile, laboring away in some obscure port portion of Babylon who's far from his homeland and wondering if God will keep his covenant after the exile in the way that he did before? The point of this book is to say, God is able to rescue those who worship him alone. God is able to rescue those who worship him alone. God is the refuge of those who worship him alone. That's the point. Overwhelmingly, our God will rescue those who worship him alone. You feel that point in this story. 
No power, no power of death, no power of kings, no power of crowds, no power of cultural pressure can overcome the power of our God to fulfill his promises and watch over his people who worship him alone. No power is greater than the power of God to keep his covenant to his people who worship him alone. Those who worship God alone. God has the power even over the power of death. That's the overwhelming point of this story. And you can imagine in the years and months that followed, these three men were just meditating on how true is it that the God of the covenant keeps his covenant promises. Have you read again this passage from Isaiah? Abednego, let's read it again. Let's read it again and what it reminds us of, that God will keep his promises and will be with us and will watch over us. Ultimately, Nebuchadnezzar himself identifies one of the promises of the covenant when he says God has sent his angel to be with you and there's a fourth man in the fire. Now, it doesn't say, and we shouldn't go too far in declaring who, what, who exactly was this fourth man. Was it Jesus pre-incarnate? Uh, possibly. Was it an angel that represented God's presence? Uh, possibly. We don't know. It doesn't say. But the point of the fourth man is clear. God will be with you when you pass through those fires. God of the covenant will keep his covenant with you and is watching over you and nothing can happen to you outside of his control. Nothing can take over your life outside of his control. Nothing can burn you up outside of his control. No flame can consume you outside of his control. He is with you. You true Israelite who have stood for him on the plain of Babylon and denounced the false worship of Babylon and declared your allegiance to the true God, he is with you even into the very flames of your death. He watches over you. The power of death has no power over you because God has power over the power of death. You will not die until he chooses to take you home. I can only imagine... These three boys, young men, going back and studying their scriptures, being in awe again, the faithfulness of God. The full passage of Isaiah 43, 1 through 5, says this, But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flames shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. I give men in return for you, peoples in exchange for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, and from the west I will gather you. Those three men could look back and say, God, God promised us by covenant that we were in his hands and that he would watch over us and that even flames had no power over us, that ultimately we were in his hands to do with us as he will. There's no human control over our lives. Ultimately, the control is the Lord's and he has declared that he loves us. So whatever happens, we are in his hands. That covenant promise is so great Isaiah says that even peoples would be given in exchange for your life, that I've ransomed you, I've redeemed you. So how do we apply this as Christians? Well, in much the same way they did. But we look back at an even better covenant. They could look back in Egypt and say, well, God can do miraculous things, and we're in the hands of the Lord. They could look back at the covenant with Abraham and say, well, God promised Abraham that he would watch over his people, and he would care for them, and that they were in his hands, and nothing could happen outside of his sovereignty. They could look back and remember and say, I don't know what's going to happen right here on the plain of Babylon, but I know a covenant God who has proven his faithfulness to his people. Well, we do the same thing, except we look back at an even more magnanimous covenant and an even greater redemption. He said, I give Egypt in exchange for you. We say he gave Jesus in exchange for us. 
He says, I gave peoples in exchange for your life. We say he gave Jesus in exchange for our life. So if you and I are standing before a furnace and a choice, bow or die, we can say, you know what? I already know that God loves us so much that he gave his only son in exchange for us. And that death purchased my redemption. And he's purchased me and loves me and owns me. And Jesus Christ is the sacrifice for my sins. And because I'm owned by that kind of God, Absolutely not. I will not bow. I'll face whatever you want. You know why? Because my God has the power over death. And he's purchased me by the blood of his son. And I will gladly face death because it just means I get to see him. They look back at a covenant. We look back at an even better covenant and say, yes, I will face whatever death you want to delve out to me because I know the God who gave his son to die in my place. I will not worship your gods. And ultimately, he'll rescue me through the flames too. This body they may burn, but I shall see him face to face. You may take my life, but my life is found in him anyway. You may take my home, but my home is found in him anyway. I may be accused, But he has answered the worst accusation of my sin. And he loves me anyway. You may take my wealth, but I have treasures in him that cannot be taken away. You may take my reputation, but my reputation is found in him. And it doesn't matter what you do to me, because his favor is all I need. You may take my comfort. But he is my comfort and my great reward. The God of the covenant is all that I need. And his covenant is demonstrated and proved by the death of Jesus Christ on the cross and his resurrection from the grave. And I can say with Paul, it is not to me whether I live or die, but I know now that I will not be at all ashamed, only that Christ will be honored in my life, whether by life or by death. And as for me, I press on, forgetting what lies behind and pressing to what lies ahead, only for the great goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So that whether I am at home or away, I may please him. Because Christ is my life. If you want to know what freedom is, that's freedom. If you want to know what life is, that's life. If you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ, let me introduce you to real life. It's believing that Jesus died for your sins, that he loves you, and that you can face anything without fear, even like these three men did. This week, there's going to be some choices, kind of like me outside that gym. There's going to be choices. Let's choose to worship God alone. He will always be the refuge of those who are faithful to him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we entrust ourselves to you, and Lord, we don't know the future, but we want to prepare for it. Lord, I I know there's going to be a, a thousand little choices, and perhaps, Lord, for some of us, there may be big choices. It's possible, Lord, that some here may may face a literal life or death choice as they seek to proclaim your gospel. It's possible that others may face a choice of comfort, that they have to let something go in order to say, I follow God alone. It's possible that some may face a popularity choice or a relational choice. But I pray that you would magnify yourself in our eyes through this passage. Lord, that our heart would desire that your glory would be seen, would be displayed as worth more even than our lives. 
Lord, whether you choose to take things from us for your greater glory, whether we have to die in some small way or large way, Lord, reveal through us that you are our life, that we trust and love in you alone, that we will not bow to the idols of this world that we refuse to succumb to the call of false worship, that we align ourselves with your kingdom and your glory. And ultimately, we trust ourselves to you as our refuge. Our lives are in your hands. We say with our Savior, into your hands, Lord, we commit our spirit. And in his sacrifice, Lord, we trust in your favor because you have chosen us by your grace and your grace is all we need. In Jesus' name, we pray. 